Real estate is the only business that you work in to put yourself out of business. What that means is you buy when people are scared and nobody's buying. And when equity groups and banks are throwing money at you, that's the time to consider selling. And then you wait. <laughs> We've never done a guest interview, but if we we're going to do one guest interview, I'm super excited about this one. Gideon Pfeffer, uh, someone who, it's kind of a funny story. When, when did you speak at the Birmingham event? When I guess- Gosh, we, it had been a, uh, a few years ago, at least. Few years. We were at this, my wife and I went to this real estate. What what was it? It was the- uh, Michigan Multifamily Owners Association yeah, yes, annual, it, annual meeting or something. Yes, yeah. yes. And it was right down the road from here. My wife and I, I think we only own a couple of houses there. So it kind of felt like imposters. You know, we're like, well, whatever, we'll buy tickets, we'll go. Big brokerage put it on. They used to be called something else, but they're GREA now. Yeah. They were like sponsors, I think, or something. Yeah, GREA, yeah. 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 But we're there, and I come from the fitness industry. So I'm kind of used to like fitness conferences, everyone like high energy, you know, like a lot of fit people. Real estate, it's a little bit Not of a so different much. vibe. A little, little bit of a different vibe. There was like mashed potatoes and chicken, you know. <laughs> um, but they had this panel at the end, and, you know, I, I really felt out of place. Really felt kind of like an imposter. And maybe you felt this way too if you've ever gone to an event. But it's really important to put yourself out there. I'm so glad we did go there because they did a panel at the end and Gideon was on the panel. I'm like, I resonate more with this guy than anyone else. He's about our age group. You know, there's a lot of older people there. Fit, in shape, looks like he like owns his business, is very, very successful. And I reached out on, on LinkedIn and we've formed a friendship and really someone I view as like a mentor now and someone who's accomplished so much in syndication. We get a lot of questions about, hey, I want to start investing in real estate and start building a portfolio, but maybe I don't have all the capital I need to invest in myself. So that's why we have Gideon here. So Gideon, thank you so much for taking the time to be here, man. Yeah, man. I'm so happy to be here. I've been looking forward to it. Yeah. Yeah. So for those maybe Gideon who don't even understand or know what a syndication is, can you break down what, what is a syndication? Kind of like how you got started with it and why that's been your business model with building your success? The syndication or syndicating money is essentially like you hear about using other people's money to maybe buy real estate if you're following Tony and that's what a syndication is. It means that either I have the money and I don't want to use all of my own money or I, I don't have the money, but I find a great deal or great property I want to buy. And so I go out and I find people who want to be involved in real estate, but don't necessarily want to do the day-to-day -day operation of it. And I get them to believe in me and my business plan and my operation. And I say, hey, let's partner on this deal. You bring the money and I'll run the business and uh, and we'll both make money together. And so that's like from a very simple standpoint, that's syndication. So like you said, it's OPM, other people's money. Yep. So essentially you're still taking on debt on the property, but you are collectively bringing together a group of partners or group of investors for the down payment. That's right. Correct. And the bank is cool with that. They're, they understand that they're accepted. It's a little bit different than, have you seen the whole, like, I borrow private money for like the down payment? It's a bit different than that because they kind of like, they frown on that. Syndications though, they're very, they almost like expect larger properties to be syndicated. It's very, correct? it's very typical. Yes. And, and the syndication essentially would, is that you create an, an LLC to buy the property and there's various structures but in, in a very simple way everybody that contributes capital gets a percentage of that entity that then buys the property so the bank looks at everybody as investors limited in their decision making and then typically myself or you if you're thinking about doing it would be you know the, the decision makers and the people that the bank are looking for for you know experience track record and things like that now having said that you don't necessarily have to have an overwhelming amount of experience so when i start, got started in multifamily i had a lot of single family experience and had a business already however i'd never bought a multifamily property before and so even though i had done a few thousand houses the bank still said you know what experience do you have so wow. what i what i did was i partnered up with a property management company that had 15,000 units under management that looked like the building that I was buying. And I said, I might not own anything right now. I've got some property experience, but look who my property management partner is. And I say partner, I mean, just the, the, the company that I was hiring, right? So I stood on their shoulders also. And that's such a good point that getting started, like you started with single family. Yeah. But I mean, you did thousands of units in single family. I did. Yeah. So yeah. we're not ta we're not talking about like what my wife and I did, but like a couple of duplexes here, like at scale single family, yeah. right? That's so interesting to hear, even with your wealth of experience that they were still like, well, what's your multifamily experience? Yeah. And that's something we try to educate our viewers and listeners on is multifamily is you're buying a business. It's business debt, it's business loan, it's pro form. It's NOI, it's projections. Single family is different. So it's really interesting how you, you know, even you went through that. Cause I went with that same thing. We use property management 
as that experience. For those just to kind of know the perspective we're talking about here, how many assets do you have currently under man management, whether it's dollar amount, total units, like? Right now we've got about 6,300 units. The value's a little over a billion dollars of real estate. That's with a B, guys. With a B. That's with a yeah. B, yeah. yeah but you know what, I, my yeah. first my first property I bought was 64 units, you know? Yeah. A couple yeah. million bucks. It's Mount Clemens, correct? It's Mount Clemens, yeah. yeah. So guys, like just, again, perspective here, and this is what, it's like so important to go out, put yourself in environments where you are either the smallest, slowest, I hate to say like dumbest person in the room. Like my wife and I, I don't even know if we own multifamily at the time, we went to a meetup or a, an event where there are multifamily operators. And now I'm literally sitting across the table from someone who controls a billion dollars in assets. And my wife and I own 131 units, maybe 16, 17 million. Like if you're not around these types of people, it's like you're not fulfilling your fullest potential. And something else I will say too about like Gideon, it's like how I truly knew he was so successful, super giving, super giving, loving guy. I've like offered to pay multiple times for meetups and advice and uh, wisdom and stuff like that. So super impressive. So, okay. If I want to start syndicating, so like, let's say I'm listening to this and I'm like, I'm inspired. I'm inspired by Tony, Gideon, Nick. I want to start syndicating. What would be like a roadmap or a blueprint to follow for someone who controls 6,000 units? Like, how do I get started? If I don't have maybe much money myself, much experience, do, do I have to have a business first? Do I have to have some level of like success first? Or can I literally just be like, I'm broke. I'm staying at home. I'm watching this YouTube video. I want to get started. I mean, I think anything's possible, right? I think anything's possible. I think that it's easier when you have a little bit of experience. Like I said, anything's possible. So the roadmap map is I need to find a deal that seems to make sense. A deal meaning a property that I believe can yield some sort of a return. Tony's, his content's going to explain to you how to look at a property, how to evaluate it from a debt perspective. How much debt do I need to put in? How much equity? What's the return on equity based on the revenue minus the expenses that we're going to get? I know that he's he's got you covered there. Once I have that deal, I need to get that debt. I need to be able to qualify for that debt and I need to have that equity, right? So we talked about the syndication on the equity side. So that's raising enough money, having enough money or raising it from outside partners to fulfill that piece of the puzzle. Then there's the debt side. With multifamily, most of the time, you're gonna need a net worth that's equal to, at least equal to the amount of the loan amount. And you're gonna need a liquidity amount, meaning money in the bank, cash in the bank, that's equal to usually around 10% of the loan amount. I didn't necessarily have that. I mean, I had made a lot of money, but I wanted to buy 100 units. I want I, my first property was 64, my next was 300, my next was 407, and I didn't have a balance sheet, you know, for tens of millions of dollars. So, what did I do? Again, I stood on other people's shoulders. I partnered up with a high net worth individual that I had a relationship with that had faith in me that I could perform when we found these deals, and then I partnered up with another person who had a stable and following of investors. So I was the guy that found the deals and ran the deals. I had a balance sheet partner for the debt. I had another partner that had a stable of, of investors that he brought along. And that's how we bought our first three deals together through that system. Now, since as we evolved and, and, and were able to get up to a thousand units pretty quickly, then the conversation started to change. It was easier to raise money. You know, over the course of the last six years, we've raised over $350 million from investors to do what we've done, but you start somewhere. And so for me, I thought less about doing it all on my own. I was willing to give up pieces of the puzzle to create and, and find the pieces of the puzzle that I didn't have. So I had my partner for equity, I had my partner for the debt, and I had my property management company. I assembled a team that in the bank size made sense, and we went out and did it. So so much good value there to unpack. And one thing I do want to kind of like, I guess I can play like the devil's advocate of it is you had a lot of success in business and real estate. I kind of, I don't know, I got to get a gripe sometimes with the gurus out there on social media who are like, you need no experience. You need no money. You just need to know the right, because say I'm that high net worth individual. He obviously built or she built a high level of success. You don't just stumble your way to wealth, right? If I had no back, no success and nothing to fall back on, like, here's why you should trust me. Like, why do you think it'd be like a, I guess a hill to climb for someone coming without any sort of business background, any sort of business success? Yeah. I mean, look, I, I, I didn't, in my answer before, I didn't want to cut anybody out. Sure. Right. And that's why I gave that, you know, political answer of, I think that anything's uh, mm -hmm. possible. Truth be told, you know, how do you get people comfortable to give you money? I think that if you're truly interested in getting into this business, into this lifestyle, you know, it, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. You know, I, I, it took me a full 12 years prior to buying my first apartment building to 
buy my first house and sell that house and then buy more houses and go through mistake after mistake after mistake. Luckily, success, you know, the success has outweighed the mistakes. But to get that experience that allowed for the guy with the balance sheet to trust me and the guy with the investors to trust me, the bank to trust me, you need to get off your couch. You need to take action. That action could look a lot of different ways. It could be through education. It could be getting a job at a property management company, getting a job at a construction company, getting a job at a real estate investment company, learning the business and just getting some experience under your belt, a few years of experience under your belt. Not only will you get the experience, but you get the contacts. You know, you'll learn, pe you'll, you'll meet people in the industry and hopefully um, create relationships that'll serve you in the future. Everything takes time. I, I was able to raise all that money in a short period of time, but when you look at the over overall course of my career. It's been 25 years right. in the making. I was just able to capitalize over the prior experiences. Well, it's like what they say, like the band, right? Because Nick's a musician. So it's like, oh, they were a overnight success, but you didn't see that band playing for three people for 10 years and traveling around in their RV, right? It's like the old iceberg analogy. We only see the tip of the iceberg. And that's where it's like, you know, social media is such a powerful thing, but it also tries to capitalize on people's desire of viewing real estate as this vehicle of like get rich quick, right? Like, hey, I don't need, I don't need money, I don't need experience, I don't need any of that. I think that's a big thing too that you even started to allude and deep dive into is like multifamily is a business. You yeah, know, it's a business that comes with a lot. So let's talk a little bit about you mentioned, and this is something my wife and I are starting to discover since we built our portfolio with all of our own capital. Sounds cool, but there's a lot of I want to say like negatives that come along with that because if something goes wrong in that property we're solely on the hook when it comes time to sign on that debt i'm solely on the hook what's the difference when you are leveraging outside capital are you raising for reserves for a property like if an expense happens and the property can't support it how is that covered just wonder some insights for syndication just kind of like i guess taking all the pressure off the owner and the operator so i think that i don't know if it's completely possible to take all of the pressure sure. off of the operator sure. and what i learned through trial and error is that having extra reserves as you're raising money is super important. So you might be buying a property for a million bucks, let's say. You're gonna get debt for 650,000 too. So obviously you need to come up with 350,000 of equity. That's not actually the case. You probably need to come up with $500,000, right, of equity if you are if if you need 350 to bridge the gap. And what's that other 150,000 for? Well, you're gonna have to pay closing costs on the deal. You're gonna have to pay property taxes in advance. You're gonna have to pay for a year of insurance in advance. There's a lot of detail like that. That. And then I always like, to your point, Tony, I always love to have operating reserves, operating reserves for that rainy day. Oftentimes you're buying a property and you need to fix it up, but Tony shows on his on, on his other clips, right? And all the properties that he owns, he's elevating to create more revenue to make the property more valuable. Well, that costs money too. So you have to go into these properties, understanding what it looks like on paper to buy it, but how much really is it gonna cost to fulfill your business plan, right? Tony says that this is a business. It is. Every single property that I own is like its own business, right? So I'm sitting on top of 20 different large communities, but 20 different businesses and business plans and budgets to review and to, and to manage. That's exactly correct. Every property is its own business. And like you said, it's not just the down payment, it's the reserves, like just the other, two, three days ago, we had uh, there's a lot of rain out in Fenton. We own a property and there's a lot of flooding, you know, who's got to write that check? We do, right? Because a 12 unit doesn't have, you know, a whole lot of extra income to support major CapEx. So let's, let's talk about that a little bit. Obviously you deal with scale. You, you said your biggest property is 400 units. Is that correct? 737 units. 737 units, right? Talk to us a bit. Have you discovered there's like a sweet spot for profitability? And this is almost like a selfish question too that I want sure. to ask, right? Because we're buying a 56, so we're inching up to that bigger level but what what would you say is like the just the total more units the more profitable it is is it more of a sweet spot with unit count i think that for our size the sweet spot is probably between 200 and 350 units 700 units we we've got a 580 unit 717 730 it takes so much time it's like moving a big ship yeah right and so you want to move, you know, 1% of occupancy, you know, you got to fill up seven units. You want to fill up 10% of occupancy. You got to fill up 70 units, a lot of units to fill, right? Right. 200 makes more sense to us. I think that 50 units, it's all relative, right? Yep. If you're used to managing 16 units, 20 using units, 15 is going to be a bigger lift, a heavier lift, more intensive management, more people to speak to, everything. Right. right? When it comes to operations, you're still using third-party management, correct? Yeah. You know, we've learned so much of it 
it is in the operations, right? Yeah. So your role is more of what we'd call like an asset manager, right? Sure. You're managing the asset and you're managing the manager. Yeah. You know, we've heard, because we've been in masterminds and all that, we've heard, especially with the last year with the rise in interest rates and the rise in insurance costs and all that, that third party has been more and more difficult. How are you guys being so successful with third party? Would you ever bring operations in house and build out your own property management company? You know, I think that property management is challenging, whether you're doing it on your own or with a third party. There's there's definitely inherent issues with third party management and the level of scrutiny and management that you have to have over this third party property management is, is super intense. I went away, I stayed away from self-management because I just, we were building the, the property business. We, were, we had a construction company. I It was too much to deal with. I think that it's in our future as we grow our unit count. And I think that, like you said, in, in today's market environment, I think those who are self-managing are probably doing better from at least from an expense perspective than those that are not. Like you said, there's pros and cons to it. Yeah. There, there's a lot of pros and cons to it. And if you don't have like the infrastructure and the business acumen to do it, I think you could probably get really hurt with it. We've seen a lot of burnt out landlords who try to self-manage. So let, let me ask you this. With syndication, what would you say are, I don't want to say some of the, ne like we talked about some of the negatives of buying your own property. Mm -hmm. You are 100% on the line. Sure. Like I even thought about like this as I'm getting ready to close on my next deal. That guarantees solely in my name. Yeah. Like it's, and even she said it, she's like, you're more of a risk than a partnership or a syndication. Cause if you default, we can only come after you as if to where there was another partner or whatever. It's a sobering conversation to have with the lender. But it's true. That's some of the downsides of going on your own is you are solely responsible. You don't have a partner, even just for, it's where I've always appreciated our conversations, just something to like shoot the shit with and be like, this is rough. You know what I mean? Someone to lean on. Are there any downsides to syndications or any things where you've experienced versus maybe if you would have went on your own and built your own portfolio out? We've talked about it in a way I had admire the way you're doing it because it's all yours. Over time, you're going to create this huge portfolio that's going to pay you huge dividends long term, and you don't have to answer to anybody. At the same time, being on the hook for all the debt on your own and having to come up with all the money on your own, you know, that's that's a give and take. So I don't necessarily know if there's a better way one way or the other. I think that often folks don't start your way. Often folks start my way. And then as they build up cash and more equity from their business, their, their, their properties, they start doing deals with less and less investors. And eventually, get to a place where they've got, they're doing it all on their own or just very few investor partners. But we've had conversations about it, right? I mean, I, I if I'm in your shoes, I'm not necessarily going out and getting a bunch of investors, right? But maybe a few strategic ones that share your vision that are willing to be limited, meaning you get to call all the shots and they just trust you. That's in writing, right? In the operating agreement, but maybe where you can kind of expand perhaps, right? Because you're, you're, you're taking on a little bit of other people's monies would give you the opportunity to get more. And that's the biggest thing is like, as you grow, like you said, you have to look at certain metrics of how you're going to keep growing, like a limitation when you're using your own capital. If you tie up all your disposable investment income, you're kind of sitting like something we were talking about in our earlier video when we were filming content. It's like, well, when's the next one going to be? Probably for a while because we're heavily invested here as to, as to where you can go pull out outside capital more, you can grow a little bit quicker. So no, I definitely appreciate you sharing that. Talk talk a little bit. I'm sure it's going to be a whole kind of episode in itself. Talk a little bit about silent investor. Like these investors that are coming with you, are they like calling you up every day and like, hey man, how's how's the portfolio doing? Or how's the investment doing? Or like, hey Giddy, I think we should paint it blue, not not white. Like, how, no. how do you control that? No, and like, right. how do you structure the deal to where you're in control of the asset? Because you're you are the expert. Yeah, I mean, I think that setting clear expectations with investors up front about what it means to be an investor with me is important. I have to be proactive in my communication so people aren't left guessing. For us, for our company, we're sending monthly reports on just what's going on at the property along the pictures. And then we're doing kind of a thorough quarterly report that has financials and variances to budget, positive and negative, and being very transparent. This year, I added uh, doing webinars for all of my properties. So nice. People can listen or they can watch live. They can listen or watch after the fact. I've got the port, then I've got the webinar. More communication is better than less. The investor doesn't have to open up the email if they don't want. But the truth is that my cell phone is on my email and everybody has access to me. And the more accessible I make myself, the more respected I think that I am. At the same time, in terms of my time, right? People call me, they're like, I appreciate it. I know you're busy. I just have a question, but that also builds trust of being available. If somebody calls me up and says, I don't like the paint. I'd say, I appreciate your feedback and this is why it's painted blue or I appreciate that feedback and talk to you soon. Yeah. But look, you know, you also deal with people who, you know, maybe listen, not every deal is perfect. Some don't go as according to plan. You also have to deal with challenging conversations, harder conversations, explaining yourself, even though things that are going wrong might not have anything to do with you. And so, you know, there's good and bad 
bad and, and, and sometimes you end up with people who are, who are unhappy, you know, and, and that's inevitable. So just knowing what you're getting yourself into and having good, respectful boundaries, I think is important. I really appreciate you sharing that because see, that's something I didn't even think about. Like you said, if we have an asset that's maybe hit a peak or it's hit a bit of a rough period or we had some vacancies creep up, right? There's internal pressure between my wife and I, right? Like we got to correct the ship, but there's not external pressure too right. of other people being like, hey, what the heck? Because at the end of the day, you and I know in business, the only constant is change. Things can go wrong, especially if you're dealing with a real hard asset, mm -hmm. right? Things can go wrong. So I appreciate you sharing that. And something I'd even like to follow up with is, have you ever had a, a really irate investor? And like, cause I'm sure for me, and I'm sure for people watching and listening, that's gotta be a limiting factor of wanting to get into syndication is what if people get mad? What if, God forbid, I lost a property? Like someone we uh, are close with is Robert Martinez down in Houston. And the, the real deal just did a whole article. He had to give a property back. Yeah. First time in his career, 20, 25 years. Yeah. Uh, he invested a lot of his own money to try to right the ship. It was, to his explanation, third party management. And then the variable rate they were on couldn't improve the NOI. And the lender called no. And they had to uh, default. Not only losing your own money, but losing other people's money. How do you deal with the pressure of raising other people's capital, yeah. right? And the expectation that like you and I get it because we're in it, but maybe someone who's never owned property, they're like, what do you mean there's vacant? What do you mean they didn't pay their rent, right? How do you handle? You gotta be grounded and you gotta know what you're walking into. Having difficult conversations with anybody, investors, let alone investors is hard. If I'm doing everything that I can do, if my team is doing everything that we can do and we know that and external factors like the market changes, interest rates going up 500 basis points in a year, things that are outside of our control. All we can do is communicate that to investors. We've got a couple of deals that we bought on bridge at the end of 2021, early 2022 that are in somewhat precarious positions. We've got great relationships with our lenders, more like partners with our lenders as it relates to when times like these are challenging. So I'm, I'm optimistic that we'll be able to kick the can and wait for better days, but it's stressful. And, you know, again, transparency, being in front of it. If an investor is upset, same thing as if uh, somebody I care about is upset. I do my best to listen, not be defensive, be empathetic, mirror what they're saying and say, I understand you're frustrated. Let me tell you what we're doing to try and make it better. And at the same time, I've had some people who've been at times not nice to some of my team members and I've and I've had to speak up on their behalf in a respectful way. So you just roll with it, deal with it. Hopefully, you know, it works itself out. Something we learned too is just in any business, there's pressure. Yeah. And the, more, the more you grow, the more pressure you deal with. And your ability to stay emotionally calm, cool, and collected under pressure is really your predication of success. Right? You, the more pressure you can handle and the more you can say emotionally like, calm and cool and collected the more success you can handle right because i think people think like oh man he controls a billion dollars he must just like roll in money and have no pressure like way more pressure that comes with a billion dollars in assets versus 16 million in assets you know yeah. what i mean one of my favorite musical artists biggie small said it more money more money more, more problems, problems man i mean Dude. be careful what you wish for right yeah. you know i thought that when i went from single family to multifamily, it'd be a nice way to kind of relax a little bit more meanwhile yeah. all of a sudden you buy eight thousand units and you've yeah. got 40 team members and all this stuff. I mean, it's, it, it's a lot of work, you know? Yeah. It's that iceberg again. You know, people don't see the effort, but there are great rewards. So as we're as we're wrapping up here, first off, guys, hey, if you're enjoying this interview, if you're liking this style of content, if you're learning a lot, be sure to drop us a comment below. Be sure to ask any questions you have that way we can continue to make content like this. And as always, you know, we appreciate your support for being here. So if I was going to ask you to look into your crystal ball and look into 2024 and 2025 for the landscape of multifamily. What do you think? You're probably in rooms and are on calls or just in circles that the average investor is just not in because of the success you've built and the you know wealth you've accumulated. Any any insights for us, man? Like, is it survived to 25? Like what everyone's saying just for these rates to come down? Or are you seeing anything that you could share with our listeners? I think that from my perspective, I like to stay optimistic. And at the same time, I think that nobody knows where interest rates are going to go. I think they're going up another quarter percentage. And I think they're going to stay here for a while. I think that 2024 is going to be rough. And I think that 2024 is the year that we're going to really see the realization of where the new valuations of units are. The prices that we bought at and we were able to sell at between 2019 and beginning to 2022 were accelerated because of an extremely 
incredibly artificial interest rate environment. When interest rates rise, values go down. Neither you or I want to hear that because we own properties that we bought at that time period. And there's going to be an opportunity to buy at a lower basis now and ride the next real estate curve up. So I do believe it survived till 25. I do believe that there's other people like our friend in Houston that you mentioned, different loans like that I have, and people that aren't, maybe don't have the staying power of the relationships maybe that like my group has, who are going to have to give those properties back or sell them at a discount. And I think that for people who are interested in real estate are in it already, are looking to get involved in it, there's going to be a great opportunity, maybe not in the next 12 months, but definitely in the next 36 to 60 months, right? Three to five years to buy at a good time and, and see appreciation and value creation because now we're at, now in a trough of a market cycle. And something we've learned too is time in the market beats trying to time the market. Let me know because you obviously have way more experience than I do. You only lose if you run out of time or money, right? Yeah, sure. And if you have, like you said, that holding power, as long as you're running your business plan, as long as you're improving that NOI, you can get through that rough period, you should be able to come out on top. I'll take it a step further too. Like you you said some nice things about me and, and, uh, and how we developed this relationship. I never want to take money from you or anybody else that wants some advice because there are people who are at a whole nother level than I am, right? Who are older than me and have been through it for another, you know, 20, 30 years more than me that have helped me selflessly, right? And, you know, uh, give me advice. I, I recently sat with one. I was always focused on how many units, how many units am I going to have? Like this, like this idea of personal value is tied to how many units I've got. He said to me, he's like, don't fall in love with something that's not going to love you back. And he said, real estate is the only business that you work in to put yourself out of business. And what that means is you buy when people are scared and nobody's buying and when groups equity groups and banks are throwing money at you, that's the time to consider selling. And then you wait. Maybe we'll buy another 8,000 units in the next five years, but maybe then I'll go back down to 6,000. Maybe I'll sell some right now, cash up because we've got some good equity, buy again. And for me, now it's less about how many units I've got and am I using those units as a tool for real wealth creation. So you said you can't time the market. I think you're right, but I think there's some indicators that could let us know. Now, this guy, he stopped buying in 2019. So you missed that whole And he was like, and I missed out, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. But he didn't buy in 2021. So the values of the stuff that he stopped buying are probably where the values are today. So he didn't lose money on the upside and he sold a bunch, right. which made him a ton of cash. So, you know, do you leave some chips on the table to be safe? You know, I, we'll see. We'll see what happens in the next run. And see, guys, that's just the power of mentorship and learning, yeah. right? And that's why I've always said, like coaching and knowledge is like it's transparency, right? Like as you give to someone else and they give to the next person. You, you've obviously been around very successful people. Would you say the most successful people are also the most giving? There's a lot of successful people that probably haven't given me the time to say, sure, yes. <laughs> right? Fair but, enough, but, fair but enough. But yeah, I will yeah. say that you can have a lot and it's more rewarding to give. You know, I yeah. think that for me, material success has, is amazing. Money isn't everything, but it makes life a hell of a lot more easy. But the more rewarding things in my life have been tied to service and giving. I always say, the more you give and the more you grow, the more you receive, yeah. right? And, so. and, and be willing to ask for help. My whole 20s, in my 20s, in my single family years, I was very prideful and I didn't want to ask for help. I didn't want people to know that I was vulnerable and didn't have it all figured out. And I think I missed out on success and probably made more mistakes than I needed to because I wasn't willing Willing to ask, to be inquisitive and to share that maybe I didn't know everything. To your point, put yourself out there, put yourself in, in circles that maybe you feel like are above you. Realize that all of us are the same. We're all people. We're not one up or one down. We're just, maybe some of us have a little bit more time in the business. I'd realize that it's it, often it's an inside job in my head. Like just put yourself out there, ask for help like you did, right? You're just like, hey, can we totally. chat? And uh, and you learn. Something we always say, if you are going to reach out to someone above you, they come with the giving hand. I think like my first message was like, dude, I've got two questions. I'll take five minutes. Because the most successful people that I've been around, they don't need more money, but their time is their most limited resource, right? Like my mentor first taught me. When you're broke, you have time, but you don't have money. Once you develop success and you have money, you don't have time. Being aware of that, being aware of that. As we're wrapping up here, if I want to get started with a syndication, maybe I do have some business background, right? I've got some, some of these core prerequisites. I've got some of a business acumen. What's my first step? Do I call up friends and family? Do I go on social media? Do I go find a deal, get it under contract, and then try to figure out where I'm going to get the equity of? If you had to start it all over again, knowing what you know now, you had to do your first syndication. Like what, what are some systematic steps you would take? Yeah, I think the short answer is all of the above at the same time. Oh, okay. All right. Hey, I don't want to go under contract on a deal that I don't don't know I'm going to be able to raise the money for. And at the same time, I don't want to ask for money if I'm not serious about going out and finding deals. So making the decision that this is something that I want to do, having enough education on how to do it, starting to plant seeds with people that this is what I'm looking to do is going to garner 
interest or non-interest from people who might be investors. When you have interest, maybe that'll give you confidence. You can find out, have dig into the conversation, what type of what type of returns are interesting to you, what, what type of properties or locations are interested in you. Further conversation on if I were to, would you, right? I love that. Yeah, I just made that up. That was great. If, hey, if I, well, it's kind of like curiosity, right? It's like a soft, like yeah. almost a soft ass, right? Yeah. Hey, if I were to buy this building, because that's always what I've wondered. If you get, it's kind of like what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Like, do I get the deal and then try to raise the capital? Or like, well, if I raise capital, but then I don't actually have a deal lined up, you know, then they might say, well, I invested here, right? So like, how do you kind of time that up for like a new syndicator? Because obviously you probably have a large role no, of No, I mean, like, I, I think that it it's still always the case. So luckily my my partners and I can write, uh, write the check now. And, right. Um, um, but we still always syndicate. I think that you have to understand what money's looking for. I found it hard to raise money without a deal in hand, at least starting out. So the deal first. The interest in the premise of buying a deal. Okay. And then you go and find a deal. Okay. You don't lock, you don't lock it up, but you you say, okay, I'm, I'm gonna make a, a run at this deal and take that deal and say, if I were to get this, are you in? I love what you said, because you don't want to lock it up because that's a great way to piss a broker off. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. <laughs> I mean it's tenuous, man. It, yeah. You're walking a tightrope between between equity and, and right. broker relationships and all that, and it's possible. You know, for us, value add has been our bread and butter. And I think that it still exists, but I think that it's easier to move the needle on value add in today's market on that 100 unit or less. And what I've seen in larger properties right now is expenses are super high and occupancies are a little bit softer, collections is a little bit softer. And I think that we've hit kind of a, like a ceiling to how much rent growth we can get, at least at a large scale. So I think that we have to be much more discerning in our acquisitions, all of us, because it used to just be a no brainer. It used to just be that you could buy something, fix it up and you could raise the rents. But it's easier to do that when you when it's a 16 unit or 50 unit than if it's a 500 unit, you know? You, you have to find less people yeah. that are yeah. willing to pay that much, right? As interest rates have not hit their peak, right? Once the Fed says we're done, I think that the market starts settling into a new normal. But until they do that, it's really hard to know where value add. The idea is you're, you're increasing value, increasing value of the property, and then you sell a refinance, right? right? But if interest rates haven't stopped going up, you're elevating value while interest rates are holding your value down. Right. So it's like for us right now, it's just brand new properties, like stuff that's just been delivered. So luxury, just park it or distress, which we haven't really seen a ton of yet. So that, that's that's what we'll be looking at. He owns what I want to get to, like down the line, because class A luxury build way different than class C. But you can move the needle quicker in class C. That's where a lot of value creation is in a short period of time. Is it true everyone starts in class C and works their way up? Or do some people come right in just like, I'm only buying class A? I don't think so. Question. I don't yeah. think that's true. Yeah. I don't think everyone starts in class C, but I actually, it, it, it makes sense though that people who are bootstrapping it and figuring yep. it out like yep. you did and like I did yep. are starting in class C because that's where the cheaper property is at. Correct. I didn't grow up with the trust fund. Right. So like I couldn't, or like a family business in real estate, maybe my children, if they choose to want to work with me, can go right into class A. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, they'll be pretty, uh, yeah. pretty, pretty skyrocketing. I hope for their sake, they yeah. go right into class A. Well, Gideon, this has been so informative. Again, I knew if we were gonna do one interview, this would have to be the interview we do. So for those who are just super interested in this, they wanna hear more about you, your story, what you're accomplishing, your, your business, all those great things, where should they go to find out more? Go to uh, gshrealestate.com, gshrealestate.com. Com. Shoot us a, an email, fill out a form. If you're interested in learning more, love to have a chat. Word on the street is there's a TikTok account coming and some, some major good content coming. Is that true? I believe that there is content there's on its way content. in 2024. On its way. Hopefully it survives till 25. Yes, yes. I love it. <laughs> well, guys, as always, thank you so much for being here. Hopefully you got a lot of value out of this. If you enjoyed the content, please let us know. Leave a comment below. Be sure to comment, like, and subscribe. Until next time, thank you so much for being here. Talk soon. Thanks. Bye.